سب جو آپ کرتے ہیں وہ صحیح بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سو ٹوڈے آور لیکچر از آن اچھا اس کو تھوڑی دیر لگتی ہے آن میجرنگ ایسوسیشنس دس از ون آف دا موسٹ بیسک جابس آف تھوڑے سلو ہوتا ہے شروع اچھا ٹھیک ہے دس از ون آف دا موسٹ بیسک جابس آف اکانومیٹریشنس ٹو فائنڈ آؤٹ ایف دیر از اے ریلیشن شپ بٹوین ٹو ویریبلس ہاؤ ایور دا وے اٹ از ڈن ان نارمل اکانومیٹرکس ٹیکسٹ بکس از کمپلیٹلی رانگ آن مینی ڈفرینٹ ویز فرسٹ دا مین میتھڈ وچ از یوزڈ از کو ریلیشن Now, regression is just a fancy way to do correlation. It is not any different. As I will show, <laughs> correlation is um, very deficient as a way of measuring association. And uh, there is a whole lecture. I hope that you are, uh, know about the website for this. I am... course because I'm putting the lectures on it as I go along and uh, related material. So uh, there is a lecture, the last lecture I gave on this same issue um, is available. Now I won't, uh, I'll give a lecture which is uh, more advanced and um, actually in that, at that time as I said I didn't know the solution. This, in this lecture I'll give you the solution. which doesn't exist anywhere else to the best of my knowledge. Any, um, it is not some technique which is used anywhere else <laughs> in um, econometrics, although it's known to statisticians, of course. So, one of the problems with correlation is that it doesn't work very well in most situations. And the second problem is that the... You see, association means that two variables move together. Uh, what we really want to know is causality. Does change in X cause change in Y? This cannot be assessed purely from data. It requires knowledge of the real world. So, for example, if we have some relationship between smoking and cancer, there's a correlation, then the question is, Is it true that smoking causes cancer or is it true that cancer causes smoking? This can also be true. Uh, in fact, initially when uh, this problem came up, the cigarette companies were very anxious to prove. So they argued that people who are cancer prone also like to smoke. So there is a tendency to be cancer prone and this tendency is... <coughs> so uh, this argument can be made. So there were ways to... actually uh, counteract that. Maybe, uh, people did experiments. They took uh, twins, identical twins, uh, one of whom smoked and one of whom did not. So then they found that the twin who smoked was more likely to develop cancer. So that means that if there is an inherent tendency towards cancer, uh, this would not have worked like that. The twins would have been the same. So they, they proved it. So Uh, what I am showing by this argument is that when uh, it comes to causality, which is a very crucial thing, everything depends on, on this uh, causality, the tools that data analysis is not enough. You have to go more deeply into the real world. Again, this is an issue which is ignored in most econometrics textbooks. But now I will um, come to the... <coughs> so... Our main task in econometrics, which is again very different from what uh, is taught in econometrics textbooks, is that we try to find associations. These things are moving together. Then when we find an association, we have to ask what is the reason. So if X and Y are moving together, then it could be that X causes Y, it could be that Y causes X. It could also be that there is a common cause which is hidden. There is some other variable which is causing both of these things to move, but it doesn't by itself, uh, neither X causes Y nor X causes Y causes X. 
or it can also be a bidirectional causation and there are a few other reasons as well but um, this uh, causal causality will not come out of the data you will have to go <laughs> to explore the real world to find out the causality and the causality is the most important thing so the what we learn from econometrics is just clues to reality it is like the surface uh, that we can see and the reality is hidden behind that surface and so uh, this is a, a very common mistake in um, um, the thinking that is generated by econometrics is that um, you run a regression and you think that that's it any uh, regression is the job in fact when I was at Triple I, one student came in with a presentation in which he said that um, you can take a regression equation and if you have um, uh, five variables, then you have uh, mm, five times four times uh, three, and hundreds of thousands of combinations. And each combination is a thesis because one regression is one thesis. So <laughs> This is just because people think that the regression is the last thing and in fact the regression is the first thing, it's a beginning. If there is an interesting pattern then it, uh, the regression uh, tells us some clues and then a lot of more additional effort is needed to get something real. So we get clues and often these clues can be deceiving. You can have a high correlation and it can actually have the opposite meaning. For example, there can be a correlation between, uh, there are many examples, uh, uh, between the salary of the teacher and the quality of education being provided. But actually, this correlation could be due to some factor different from what appears to be the case. Uh, for example, there can be a correlation between students who get tutoring and their grade. But it may be that the tutoring is completely worthless. The fact that the student is getting tutoring shows that he is more highly motivated. And it is that motivation which is leading to the grade, not the tutoring. So these things can happen. So the clues can be there, but the clues can be misleading and point in wrong directions. And this happens very often in reality. So, for example, there were studies of surgery which showed that the people who got the operation survived longer and the people who didn't get the operation didn't survive longer. But as I said, I think I explained this earlier, this was misleading because the two groups were not comparable. The surgeons would pick the most favorable candidates for their surgery and so those people would have survived longer anyhow. So what appears on the surface may not actually be the reality. So, how to avoid being deceived and how to evaluate hypothesis, this is one of the most important tasks and it's not an easy task, it's very important. But the uh, task involves more thinking and not mathematics. People think that <coughs> if I have a problem in regression, I apply some very fancy technique and I will solve that problem. This is not the case. It's not a question of technique, it's a question of understanding what is going on and trying to solve that problem. We will look at many examples like this later. Now we are just doing ABCs. So, the standard method of association is correlation, but this is valid only for normal distributions and only for linear relationships. Sometimes these conditions are met and sometimes these are approximately met and so you can get reasonable results. It's not that it's never uh, correct, but uh, it is often wrong or misleading. Uh, the second uh, problem with correlation that I have uh, mentioned, which I is not on this uh, slide, is that very often in econometrics people make, people uh, find correlation and then they make causal claims. They say that, okay, I did a regression of uh, growth on education I got a good result. This means that if we uh, get education, uh, if we promote education, we will get higher growth. This is not true because actually, as we will show, I think, later, if you uh, do a correlation of how many newspapers there are in that country, 
with uh, growth you get a very strong correlation. So it doesn't mean that if you increase the number of newspapers you will get more growth. So correlation is not causation, but in economics very, very often this is uh, not mentioned and uh, as, uh, gets a confused treatment. So because correlation is not a good measure of association, uh, there is a better alternative which I will <coughs> describe in this uh, lecture which is contingency tables method which we will get to later. Okay, so here is an example of <coughs> correlation. <coughs> this is uh, data for um, 1990 on um, about 100 countries and for each country we are plotting the life expectancy in 1990 and also the number of newspapers per uh, 100 population. So, as you can see, uh, there is a pretty strong relationship. On the x-axis you have the life expectancy. So, it starts at 30, which is a very low number. By the way, you should get used to any data analysis involved, picking out outliers. So, this this, uh, there is one country which is uh, extreme outlier in life expectancy. Which one is it? Why is it? This is something that should be in your mind. And there are two countries which are outliers in the other direction. Uh, they have very high life expectancy and much higher newspapers. So they are, these are two countries where they are at the top near 600. They have lots of newspapers and nearly maximum life expectancy. From this picture, you can see some things which, um, one thing that you can see is that basically there is a barrier to life expectancy. Yani, uh, incomes are increasing, if you remember from your other data, but life expectancy gets hits a wall at, at 77 or so, you can't increase it much more. Basically, there is a lots of very poor uh, rich countries and there is lots of variation in the newspaper. But the life expectancy is just flat vertical. Uh, so this, this makes sense. I mean, intuitively we understand that no matter how much wealth you have, you can... And there is a... Obviously money does buy life. You can see here, if you are poor and you can't uh, get medical treatment, your, your life expectancy will be reduced. But if you have the maximum amount of money, then it won't be that if you have... Two million dollars you can live one more year and if you have three million you can live another year. No, there is a maximum, a natural maximum and after that you can't, no matter how much money you have, you can't extend it. So this is what the picture is also showing, that there is a maximum. So uh, the, now the relationship is highly non-linear as you can see clearly. There is no, there's no straight line which is going to go through this data. And if you look at the correlation, uh, coefficient it's 0.64, 64 percent, which shows the, that there is a positive, strong positive correlation. But, uh, okay. Now, just to uh, make sure everybody knows, uh, I'm just going to go through the explanation of how you calculate the correlation. And uh, so the first step is to center the data. So that means you subtract the mean. So this is in the top picture. Uh, now basically the mean life expectancy was around 60 or something like that. So we subtracted this from every number. So now the uh, what was 30 is now minus 35 or so, minus 33 because we have subtracted 60 from it. And um, basically the same pattern exactly as before, the only the zero has changed. The zero is now in the middle of the diagram. And uh, similarly for the newspapers, uh, it goes from minus 100 to plus 500 instead of going from zero to 600 because the, it was about 100 was the average. So this centers the diagram by subtracting the means. And then there is a second step which is to divide by the SD. So this is called standardization. It in, standardization involves two steps. One is to center the data and the other is to scale the data. <coughs> so after we scale the data, 
uh, then you see basically uh, if the data is normal then minus 2 to plus 2 is your usual center of the data uh, of the data and points bigger than minus 2 and plus 2 are sort of in the tails of the distribution this is a concept we will be using later on in this lecture so if you look at the data you will see that there is one outlier uh, see now after centering and scaling the data will fall into four quadrants one is the plus plus where both uh, both observations are above mean and the other is minus minus where both observations are below mean so if the variables are related to each other if there is a positive correlation then most of the data should be in these two quadrants the minus plus and the plus minus shows that one of them is positive one of them is high see uh, it's a uh, we will think of plus as being high and minus is being low so uh, the plus plus quadrant says that when one variable is high the other one is also high so that means that there is a relation and uh, the minus minus is when one variable is low the other one is also low again there is a relation now minus plus means lack of relationship because one variable is low but the other one is high or one is high but the other one is low so as you can see there is almost nothing in the minus plus area because of the nonlinear relationship there is lots of points in the plus minus uh, where the plus minus is life expectancy is high but the newspapers are low uh, there is no country in which life expectancy is low but newspapers are high that's a bit strange why we can think about those and then um, I have identified here the outliers for you the Japan and Norway both have 3.5 newspapers now this is in standard deviations that means that they are more than three and a half standard deviations away from zero so they are yani if the normal distribution was correct they are very very significantly different from the rest these are Japan and Norway people do a lot of reading there and they also have lots of time to read because they have long life expectancies uh, and the country which is an outlier with respect to uh, it is at the bottom both for newspapers and for uh, life expectancy they have short lives and don't have time to read that was a joke by the way <coughs> now uh, this is the standard way that people handle this problem of non-linearity take log of the newspapers now when you take the log then the linear pattern becomes much clearer now you can if you run a regression on this data you will get reasonable results this is not too bad uh, the, there is a linear relationship and also normality is not a uh, problem here it seems more or less okay so here the correlation becomes 90 percent so just by uh, renormal by, by taking the log of the newspapers we have improved the correlation by quite a lot but this is um, this actually shows a defect of the correlation because the correlation the, the association between the variables is the same whether you take the log or not but the correlation measure only picks up linear relationships very well and does not do very well at nonlinear relationships so in fact the other method I'm going to show you is not affected by this so there's a huge jump in correlation here is another problem which arises here we have a picture of uh, y equals x squared which is a quadratic perfect relationship so association should be almost uh, perfect 100 percent but actually if you look at the correlation the correlation is zero so if you if you run a regression the line will be flat and it will say that because basically the negative and the positive basically cancel each other so uh, while correlation between y and x squared is 1 correlation between y and x is 0 so the this is understood that which is the right measure obviously 1 is the better measure because these two variables are related to each other so it is understood that if you are going to use correlation then you should make a transformation 
uh, you should make a transformation of the data so as to achieve normality and so as to achieve linearity because that will allow the correlation to work. But if you do that, then this becomes open to cheating. I mean, you can make uh, various kinds of transformations which will uh, create a relationship where there is none in the original data. So uh, the correlation methodology is pretty uh, um, bad in terms of assessing relationships. Then uh, again, um, so as I've said, there's an effect of uh, nonlinearity on correlation. And now I want to look at the effect of outliers. Now we've already looked at the brain and body data. Um, I just um, calculated the correlation using a correlation calculation program. So it says that the correlation between the brain in grams and body in kilograms is minus 0 0.005. If you remember, the data is uh, that the most of the data is uh, on a straight line, especially after log log. But uh, the three dinosaurs are huge, and they are uh, actually. If you run a regression, the, those outliers drive the relationship. So even though most of the data is positively related, the regression line will be negatively sloped. Basically, the correlation coefficient is very closely related to the regression slope coefficient. So the regression slope will be negative. So if you run a regression on this data directly without taking logs, then you will um, find that there is a negative relationship between the brain size and the body. The larger the body, the smaller the brain, which is completely wrong, but it is driven by the three dinosaur outliers. Now, if you look at log brain and log body, uh, that improves things. Uh, if the correlation goes to about 78%. Uh, the outliers are still having an effect, but they are not driving the data, data anymore. Because what happens, you see, when you have the original data is that the uh, body weight is in tons and tons and it's very large and it basically is a huge outlier. When you take the laws, it's an outlier, but it's a much smaller outlier. And so it doesn't completely dominate the rest of the data, so you get a positive re relationship because nearly all of the data is positively related. If you remove the outliers, the three dinosaurs, then you get to 96%. So again, what um, this shows is any correlation uh, is strongly affected by outliers. You can go from negative to uh, medium to high, depending on how you treat the outliers. Unlike this, the methodology I will show you later is not affected by outliers. So, uh, so there are uh, three different problems with correlation. One is that there is a uh, linear relationship uh, is assumed if the functional form is different, then it will cause problems. The other is that there is no outliers. Again, this is tied to the normality assumption. In normal distributions, there are no outliers. So if the normal distribution is valid, there will not be any outliers and your correlation will work. And the third one, which I haven't mentioned, is that if you have clusters, then you have, again, problems <coughs> with correlations. So the logic of correlation is that it's very simple logic. If x moves up, y also moves up. If x moves down, y also moves down. So on the average, if most of the points are in the plus plus or in the minus minus, then you have a correlation uh, which is positive. And uh, there is some something to investigate. There is a problem. That why is it so that whenever x moves up, y also moves up? I mean, there is something to explain. There is a phenomena about the real world that is happening and you need to find out well, maybe it's x causing y maybe y causes x maybe they have a common cause or there has to be some other reason it can't happen just by itself that these two things are moving together it cannot happen by chance however if you have outliers if you have a strong outlier then this logic fails suppose you have a situation just for uh, sake of illustration that 
The first n observations are very small and then you have one huge outlier. What will happen is that the average will be in the middle of uh, the small observations and the big one. So all of the small n small observations will be low, they will be small and there will be one big observation. Suppose the other series also has a huge outlier. Then again it will have the same kind, kind of pattern. All of the observations will be low and the last one will be high. So if you take any two series with a high outlier, uh, they will have a strong correlation because the, but, but it is meaningless. This is what's known as a spurious correlation or an artificial or a fake correlation. So it seems like there is a strong correlation, but there isn't. Again, as I will say, um, okay, so here the solution to this problem is to not use the mean. The mean is very strongly influenced by the outlier. If you use the median, this problem will not arise. So that's, uh, and, uh, so that's what we are going to do. Okay, now there is another very big problem when you have trends. Here is the picture for uh, Brazil GNP and Botswana GNP, which is a small country in Africa. There is no reason for any relationship between these two economies. Both economies are completely separate. But if you run a correlation, you will get a huge positive correlation. Why? Well, because both of these have countries have GNP which has been trending, increasing over time. So if you take the average GNP, it occurs somewhere in the middle of the period. All of the early periods are low, all of the late periods are high. And this is the true for both of these countries. So, you have a strong correlation and uh, no reason for it. I mean, this is not, uh, this is not really, these two series are not associated, but the correlation will mislead you into thinking that they are correlated. So, this is, this is the classical case of spurious correlation. Um, so, basically, if you have series with trends, then correlation cannot be trusted. And also the method that I will describe will not be usable in this situation. I will, uh, for that we will have to work separately. Uh, this one, this problem cannot be solved by the method that I will tell you. <coughs> so, but there is, uh, we will uh, come back to try to solve this problem because this is one of the most important problems of econometrics <coughs> that how do we judge the association between two series when both of them have trends? Because the regression methodology does not work. And this is, in fact, this is the whole theory of integrated series and co-integrated series. This was all invented to solve exactly this problem, that the regression theory does not work correctly when you have trending series. This was discovered in the 1980s, and then there was a huge literature on integrated <coughs> series. This is the standard approach to solving the problem, which is also a wrong approach. This integrated co-integration is not actually a good approach to solve the problem, but it is an approach to solve the problem of how to handle series which are both having trends. And we will discuss this problem separately later. It's much more difficult <coughs> than the problem that we are uh, facing. Now, but one elementary aspect of this problem is basically that the high move and the low move should be unpredictable. The, the variable should move, should be either high or low with uh, randomly. So one way is to use the median because when you use the median, then being above median and below median is uh, equally likely. Both are, because median is in the middle, so half the values will be high and half will be low. And this is different from using the mean. Uh, when you have an outlier, it can be that only one variable is high and all of them are low. And that's not a random movement. The other part of random movement is that it should be unpredictable. Yani once it's high and the second one is low. So if it is unpredictable and there are two unpredictable series and they are both moving similarly, then you have a problem. You have something you have something to explain. But if one series is completely predictable, as happens in the trending series, that all of the early observations are low and all of the late observations are high, then these are not random moves. And if they are not random moves, then they are they, they cannot 
they are, they don't uh, there is nothing surprising about the fact that two series are matching up so how to get random moves in trending series that's very important topic which we will discuss later in cross sections this problem does not happen uh in the sense that in the cross section there is no order if we have a sequence of countries i can put them in alphabetical order or i can put them in any other order that i like and so it's not that the first half will be low because there is no first half you can arrange the data in any way so in cross sections if you take the deviations from the median then uh, these should be random and yani some random half will be above some random half will be below there is going to be no pattern that is uh, systematic so basically in this lecture we are dealing with how to measure association in cross sectional data not in time series because in time series we have different problems as i have said in time series the only way, the way to do it is to remove the trend first but how do you remove the trend there are many different methods and uh, so that's a, another topic which we will deal with in uh, later on in the course now uh this is a first attempt at uh, measuring the um <coughs> the contingency table approach so here what i have done is that uh actually what i have done is in this table is to divide the data at the mean um for life expectancy in newspapers this is the same data set that we have been working with and look at uh how many are low low how many are low high exactly the same plus 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 minus minus plus but now i'm just counting how many things are in which cell so as it turns out we have 33 countries which are below mean in life expectancy and below mean in uh newspapers and there are two countries in which life expectancy is low but newspapers are uh, low meaning below mean and high meaning above mean so there are only two countries in the low life expectancy high uh, newspapers in the low high category in the uh, where you have high lex- life expectancy but uh low uh, newspapers you have 26 countries and then there are 31 countries which are high high in both of them so now um in this method the outliers don't matter because uh we are only counting if it is high or low it doesn't matter how high it is if something is very high uh, the mean will be affected but it will not uh, change the count uh now as it is this table i made up wrongly i mean actually this is this table is not the right table in the sense that i have looked at the mean as the separator and as i have said mean is not the right separator we need to separate it the median so this is just the match to the pattern um which we have already been seeing that there are the three quadrants in which you have 30 points and 30 points and uh, and 30 points are roughly in all three and then there's one quadrant which is empty now um if i wanted to i could show you that even though there is a very strong association if i put more points in the plus minus quadrant which fit naturally i will uh, be able to get a zero correlation because the plus minus correlation is is uh, subtracting basically how we calculate the correlation is after standardization we multiply both coordinates and we just take the average that's what correlation is standardize the data then multiply both parts so plus plus will come out plus minus minus will come out plus but the other two coordinates will come out negative and they will cancel and so if there is a large number of points in the plus minus it will offset the effect of the plus plus and minus minus and you could have a situation where you have zero correlation 
calculated but even uh, but the data shows very strong correlation so um, the picture already tells us that there is a strong association you see uh, from the picture we can see that there is a relationship but the correlation may not tell us that okay so on the other hand contingency works for um, for nonlinear relationship but doesn't work for the quadratic because um, if I divide the data into quadrants like this in the middle then um, actually it turns out that all four quadrants get about equal number of points you should be able to see that from the symmetry so when that happens then um, if all four quadrants have equal number of points then you will get uh, roughly zero correlation and that will not that's not a correct description of this data there is association my contingency table method does not work in this case but there is an import there is a way to change it to make it work and that's basically to divide the data into one third instead of half the half half is a very crude first step if we, I make more divisions I will get better results All right. Now, um, once you have a contingency table, what should you? How do you assess whether or not there is independence? So, if I have uh, the median uh, methodology, then basically half of the data will be low and half will be high. So, if the two are independent, then there should be about twenty-five percent of the data in each cell. So. Uh, then there is a standard method which is used which is called the Pearson chi-square test for independence in contingency tables you can just uh, I mean if you feed the data into any statistical package it will shoot out the result and so basically what you do is you take the actual number which was 33 subtract from the expected number which is 25 uh, square the difference and then divide by the theoretical number and you do it in each cell and you add them up and you get the chi-square this is based on the number of assumptions this is actually not the right approach for our purpose it can be in some types of contingency tables but uh, I'm just uh, showing it because this is what you will see in packages most often uh, but this is not the right approach for the contingency table for our purposes. Okay. So now what I will do is um, I will switch to the spreadsheet and show how we calculate the associations. Okay. So here... I have the first uh, okay so let me go to the Fisher test so here what we have <coughs> is the countries uh, country code country name life expectancy in 1990 and newspapers in 97 98 because that was the year for which the data was available. So we are running a correlation. So here is the original data. In Algeria, life expectancy was 67. In Angola, it was 39. It's a low outlier. Argentina, it was 71. Australia, it was 76, and so on. And then this is the newspapers per 100 population. So about 26 newspapers 11 in Angola, 65 in Argentina, 174 in Australia, 308 in Austria, and so on. Okay, so now the first step that I want to do is to find out the pattern, who, which is plus plus, which is minus minus, which is minus plus, and which is uh, plus minus. So there are many ways to do it. The methodology that I came to was to use the sine function in uh, first, I did. The, I computed the median. Here is the 
top line which is the median of the column of life expectancies. So I found that the median is 68.39. Uh, that is the median life expectancy. So half the countries have life expectancy below 68 and half of them have above 68. Uh, I've looked at the median for the newspapers and that was 46. So now here I looked at the high low for the so the sign. The sign is basically C3 which is this minus the median C1. So <coughs> the sign function is plus 1 if the number is positive, minus 1 if the number is negative, and 0 if the number is 0. <coughs> so, here we have minus 1, which means that Algeria has life expectancy below the median, which is correct because it's 67, which is below the 68 median. The next one is Angola, and it's 39, it's below median, it's minus 1. Then Argentina is 71, which is above, so it's plus 1. So like this, in this whole column we have minus and pluses according to whether the country is having life expectancy above the median or below the median. And about half of them will be, and almost exactly half of them will be above median, exactly half will be below median. The total number of countries here is about uh, 90, I think. Uh, yes, yes, it is 90. So this is an even number. So the median will actually fall between two countries. So every country will be either above or below. There will be none which is exactly at the median. If we had an odd number of countries, the one country would drop out of the calculation. It would be zero and it would not count in anything. So again, there will be an exactly equal number which is above and exactly equal number which is below. Now, the same thing we do for the newspapers. Uh, <coughs> we look at the sign of D3 <coughs> minus... D1. So we look at the sign of the newspapers in Algeria minus the median newspapers and that's minus 1. That means that Algeria is below median in terms of newspapers. Uh, uh, Angola is also below median. Argentina is above median in terms of newspapers. Australia is above and so on. <coughs> so now I have got the patterns. Still, I need to do some counting. So, uh, I did it like this. There are many ways, actually. Uh, what I did was I added these two. So, when you add, then anything in plus minus or minus plus will become zero. Right? So, the minus minus will become minus two <coughs> and the plus plus will become plus two. Right? You're just adding. So if both are minus, it will uh, come to minus 2, which is over here. <coughs> so Algeria is in the, is as minus 2, which means that it has, it is below average in expectancy and below average in newspapers. Angola is minus 2, <coughs> below average in life expectancy, below average in newspapers. Argentina is plus 2, it means above average in life expectancy, above average in newspapers and these are also plus to Australia, Austria. Here we have Azerbaijan is zero means that it has a plus minus. We don't know which one and it could be above average in LE and below average in news or the other way around. We just uh, we just have the plus plus and the minus minus in this column. So <coughs> here that is what it is and now um, what I do here is to look at this. This is the column G, which is looking at plus plus and minus minus only. So now I look at how many, here is count if is the uh, Excel command, count if the whole column G3 to G90 2 is less than 0. <coughs> so the only number which is less than 0 is minus 2, there is nothing else. So we count the number of minus 2s and it comes out to be 38. <coughs> so there are 38 countries which are low in life expectancy and low in newspapers. Uh, and here is the same count of high and there are also 38 countries which are <coughs> above 
average in uh, life expectancy and above average in uh, in uh, newspapers. Now, we, uh, for the low high combinations, this column will not work. I have I create another column, and in that column, I subtract uh, F three from E three. So I subtract the newspaper value from the life expectancy value. So now <coughs> here. Whenever the two are matching, this will become zero. So this is zero. It means that the, the number is either in the plus plus or the minus minus quadrant. I don't know which one. I don't care because uh, minus minus plus plus I've already counted. Now I'm looking at the other thing. Here we have the first non-zero two. Two means that it has high life expectancy and low newspapers because it's one minus minus one. And the other uh, is minus two. And that means that it has low life expectancy and high newspaper. So, I count the HL combinations by doing a count if, if this is greater than 0, and a count if it's less than 0, and again this is 7. So, now my contingency table is this one. This is the important thing. That I have 38 countries which are uh, low in terms of life expectancy and low, low in terms of newspapers. 7 countries which are high and the sum is 45 and in the other quadrant I have <coughs> 7 which are in this 7 and 38 in this one and total 45 uh, the total number of countries is 90 so now I have 38 in the minus minus 38 in the plus plus 7 in the minus minus and 7 in the uh, sorry 7 in the minus plus and 7 in the plus minus Notice that the way I have done this, it is guaranteed that each row will sum to 45 because you have to have half of the countries. Uh, if you add up the low and the high together in one category, that will have to be half the countries. So this has to be 45. This also has to be 45. All of the, them have to be 45. So now the question is, <coughs> well... If these two were not associated, then what we would see is uh, the middle number, 22 or 23. So, now the next question is, well, 38 is very far from this. So, the question is, is it significantly different from uh, 22 or 23? So, now this is the second part of the lecture, something that you already know, what is a critical value for a test statistic and what does it mean to reject the null hypothesis and what does it mean to accept the null hypothesis. So here we are going to argue that this number 38 is too far from 22 and that means that the idea that there is no relationship between LE and newspapers can be rejected. This is the null. The null hypothesis is, is the null hypothesis of independence, that there is no relationship between life expectancy and newspapers. And this hypothesis can be very strongly rejected. Now, the question is, how strongly can it be rejected? Why do we reject it? These are issues that I will cover because my experience is that uh, students have a very uh, poor understanding of this. And this is not the fault of the students because the way it is explained in most places is not good. I will try to give a better explanation. May not may not succeed, but anyway. So, actually, there is a whole lecture on this in a previous course, which I have put on the web page. Which, you, if you watch, you will get a much better understanding. Here, I will just cover it briefly under the assumption that <coughs> people already know uh, most of these concepts. So, here we have. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to go back. Now I'm going. Uh, I'm reviewing a concept of how do we do testing, hypothesis testing. So consider the hypo null hypothesis that I have an observation, and it is a standard normal distribution. Now I'm going to try to. Uh, the null hypothesis is that this observation is coming from a standard normal distribution. So basically, I would like to reject this null hypothesis in some cases and accepted in some other cases. 
Now the ideal thing would be to reject it when the null hypothesis is false and to accept it when it is true. But all observations have some probability. Yani normal distribution goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's just that some observations are very unlikely. And in fact, if you, I think I may have done this sometime, I always do this. You generate 1000 normal random variables, you look at them, you will see that there is nothing beyond plus or minus 5. That's a very huge outlier. Usually it's between minus 3.5 and plus 3.5, the range. So if you, uh, if you, a 1000 normal random variable will not go outside minus 3.5 and plus 3. This is what it means that the generation, the distribution doesn't have any outliers. So if you see, if you have a random variable and it is minus 7, for example, then it's possible that it could be normal, but the probability is 1 in a trillion or less. So if I see x equal minus 7, I will say that, oh, this is very unlikely that this is from normal, so I will reject the null hypothesis. Even though I could be wrong, there's a one in trillion probability that I'm wrong, but uh, <coughs> uh, the thing is that in statistics we have to take these chances because it's impossible to make perfect inference. This is the key. All inference is fragile. There is always some chance that you will be wrong. So we have this type 1 error and type 2 error that you might be rejecting the null hypothesis even though it is true and you might uh, accept the null hypothesis even though it is false. So these are the type 1 and these will always be there. You cannot make them zero in statistics. So given that we are stuck with this problem that inference is only going to be by guess, how should we handle things? Well, a straightforward and simple and logical way to do it is to say that, all right, since I can, what, what I would like to do is I would like to reject the null when z has zero probability under the null. We can't do that because nothing has zero probability under the null. Everything has. So we say, okay, what we'll do is we'll reject the null when z has very small probability under the null. Okay, so that's what leads to the standard theory of hypothesis testing. There are some central values. These are all the high probability values. And then there are tail values, which are all low probability values. If you look at this picture, this is the picture of the normal distribution. The central values are all the ones which have, all, all of them have high probabilities. The tail values all have low probabilities. The blue line is the probability. So we reject all, prob all uh, Z values which have low probability. And I have made the line at 2. So now the question, the only question is, what is the cutoff value? That is called the critical value. There is going to be some number at which we will cut things off. We will say that, okay, if the probability is less than this number, I will reject. If the probability is bigger than this number, I will accept. Now comes the only slightly tricky part in this argument because it is not the probability itself that matters. Here, for example, the level is about 5%. Uh, it is not this number that is important. The cutoff value, I mean, the, the probability at which you are cutting off, that is not the important number. That is the, the one tricky part. The, uh, that probability is, is very uh, flexible. It can be anything, uh, high or low. It varies. It's not the critical number. The critical number is <coughs> comes out, why do we choose two? Well, in this particular case, what happens is that in the central value between minus 2 and plus 2, I have 95.45% of the probability. So in the upper tail, there is 2.28 and in the lower tail, it's also 2.28 probability. So basically, what we have is a 95% <coughs> probability of uh, uh, the central and a 5% probability approximately of rejection. So basically, that's what we want to control. What is the total probability of rejection? That is the crucial number, not the cutoff level. Uh, intuitively, one thinks that the cutoff level is the important one, that we should cut off at 0 0.001 probability. But that's not it. Actually, once you choose a cutoff level, then it is not that particular <coughs> point, but it's all the points which you are rejecting for, which are below. You have to look <coughs> at all of them 
and then aggregate all of them and look at the combined probability of all of them. And here, so if I put the cutoff at 0 0.05, all of the points which are below this number, if you add up all of the probabilities, that comes out to 5%. So we say that, okay, 5%. This is a 5% level. Significance level is 95%. If I want to choose a bigger <coughs> uh, cutoff value, I can go to 99%. That goes to about minus 2.5 or so, uh, slightly less than that. And uh, I can choose whatever cutoff value. The, the thing is the significance level of the test is determined by looking at all of the points for which you are rejecting. So, <coughs> one standard method for um, selecting um, uh, the cutoff value, the critical value, is that we choose some number arbitrarily, p star, and then we say, okay, if the outcome probability is less than this number, I will reject. If it is bigger than this number, I will accept. But the P star number doesn't matter at all. What matters is that once you choose that P star, you get a rejection region. This is the important thing. This is the set of all X for which you are going to reject. Everything which has less than probability P star. Now you collect all of this set and then you can ask what is the probability of this rejection region. And now uh, and you calculate it under the null hypothesis and now you set it equal to alpha where alpha can be 5% or 1%. Now, as you change P star, the alpha will change. If you make P star very high, it will go to 1, which is, of course, a very bad um, number. If you make P star smaller and smaller, everything will go out of this region and rejection probability will go to 0. So, now you vary the P star until you, you slide it up and down until you get exactly uh, alpha equal to what you desire, which is can be 5% or 1% or some other number. So this is the standard method, but there is another method which is better than this, which is the method of p-values. Now in this p-values, instead of coming out with, uh, okay, I'm going to do this at 1% or at 5%, we ask the data, what is the percent at which you are rejecting? So that's the p-value. Instead of determining it in advance, so how do we do that? Well, first you calculate what is the observation, x star, and then you calculate what is the probability of this observation p star. And then you say, okay, if this is my rejection value, then I'm going to reject at this probability and at all lower probabilities. So now I, I, I choose the p star according to my observation. This is the probability of that observation. Then I say, okay, I'm going to reject for this probability and for all lower probabilities. So I form my set of rejection region. Then I calculate what is the probability of this rejection region. And that is called the p-value of x star. So if the p-value is very small, any, the p-value should be compared to the alpha. If the p-value is below 1%, you are going to reject at 1%. But the p-value gives a much more accurate <coughs> measure of what the data is saying. For example, in the example that we are uh, studying currently, the p-value is 1 in a million. If I say if I reje I'm rejecting the null hypothesis at significance level 99%, uh, this is not actually an accurate uh, description of what the data is telling us because the data is giving a much stronger rejection. So the p-value uh, gives us a more accurate picture of what the data is saying. Now, how do we calculate the p-value? Okay, so now I am uh, looking at the newspapers and the life expectancy and as we have discussed uh, the data on the right hand side is the contingency table it shows that there are 38 uh, countries in uh, low low category and 38 in high high now and, and 7 in the off diagonal so from this um, set of numbers, it's clear that this is not a good picture for independence because in independence, we would expect uh, one-fourth of the whole uh, quantity in each of the cells. So we would have 22 or 23 in, uh, the, uh, in any all of the cells. Basically, the midpoint is 22.5. 
but you can't have 22.5 countries, so it would be either 22 or 23. So now, what we are going to ask is, how unusual is this observation? How far away is it from the center? So what is the center? The center is either 22 or 23. Uh, notice that, and this is one very special um, thing about this, that there is only one degree of freedom here. That is, once I, I choose one of these cells, all other threes are automatically determined. Because uh, the number of countries is known from the beginning. This is the data size. And half of that is 45. That's again fixed before we do any experiment. So the four numbers, 45, 45, 45, these are fixed. Every, uh, so once I determine what's in the low, low, then uh, the low high is automatically determined by subtracting from 45. And the other one is also determined by subtracting. And then the other diagonal is also determined. So it has to, it has to be like this. So there's only one real change that is possible. I can change only one thing. So now I'm asking that, okay, 22 and 23 are the most likely observations here. Now, um, what is the probability of these 22 and 23? And what is the probability of 38? This is, this is the p-value that we want to determine. So first I have to think about what is the distribution here. And I'm going to argue that this is a binomial distribution. So that requires a little bit of logic, not difficult. First think about a unrelated problem. What is the probability that two people have the same birthday? So there are 365 days. The first one can choose any of the 365 days. We put him in. Then the second one uh, has uh, 1 in 365 chance of matching and 364 over 365 of not matching. So that's the probability. The probability of a match is 1 over 365, 364, yeah. Uh, the first one doesn't matter because no matter where you put him in, it, it doesn't matter. So. And uh, the reason I'm explaining this is because <laughs> people think that there are two probabilities involved, but there's only one probability involved. Just like this, here we have two uh, characteristics, but there's only one probability. So the way to think about it, there are many ways to explain it. One way to explain it is to okay, say that, okay, let's fix one of these things like um, newspapers. <coughs> okay, so I fix the newspapers. Uh, then half of the countries have high newspapers, 45 countries, which I know, I can list them, and 45 countries have low newspapers. Now I ask the question, suppose that I will randomly take a country and uh, put it either high or low on um, life expectancy. So, uh, uh, okay, so I will take the first country and um, I will mark it randomly high or low. The second country I mark it randomly high or low. So all of the countries that I am marking uh, without, re without looking at uh, what's happening in the first coordinate. So Countries have been sorted. There are 45 countries uh, which are high. Just let's look at, uh, look at the high part. And now each country I'm going to mark 0 or 1, whether it's high on um, life expectancy or low on life expectancy. So what's the total number of countries that are going to be high? Well, this is a standard binomial setup. Each 0 or 1 has probability 1 half. And uh, there are 45 of them. So I have a binomial random variable which has probability 50% um, of success. And there are a total of 45 cases. And each of them are independent. So that's it. So this number 38, if uh, there is no association, will be a binomial random variable with n equals to 45 and p equals to 50%. So basically, that's the binomial table that I have made here. 
uh, if you look at this uh, table, this is from Excel actually, uh, the probability of 20 is uh, basically if you look at 22 and 23 they have the largest probabilities they are symmetrically around 22.5 which is the middle so 11.7 percent is the highest probability possible and this is uh, at 22 and 23 21 is 10.73 percent and 24 is also 10.73 because they are symmetric binomial distribution it it goes exactly the same on both sides uh, 22.5 is exactly the middle of the distribution and everything is equally on both sides. So as you can see, as you move away from 22, uh, 23, your probability start declining. At uh, 32, it reaches uh, 0, 0, 002 and at 33, it's about 1 in a thousand. And then at 35, it's about 1 in 10,000. And at 38, to 4 decimal places, it's 0. Actually, I calculated it further, and I found that it's 1 in million. So, now, one way to... Uh, so, if I want to reject at 1% level, then I have to take... Oh, uh, that's the second column. The first column is just giving the individual probabilities for each number. But in order to use the significance level, I need to have the cumulative probabilities. So, you see at 22 you have exactly 50% probability. Uh, because 22 is exactly half of the observations. It's, it's the bottom half. So, you keep going up until... Uh, basically, at 27, you have 93%, and at 28, you have 96%. So, if I was to reject for um, values which are above 28, then uh, I would only be rejecting uh, about 4% uh, or 3.6% of the time. Right? If I accept the null hypothesis for all values up to 28, then um, my probability of accepting the null hypothesis would be 96.38% and my probability of rejecting would be uh, the remaining probability which is 3.6% or so. Say so, yeah. You are not following. Huh? Kya? You see, here is a normal distribution. It goes from 0 to 45. As we keep going up, the cumulative probability keeps increasing until it reaches 100%. And uh, so I want to know, at what point should I start rejecting so that my rejection probability is in the tails, the center is... So, the tail will be, when, you, when I reach 96% probability, then the remaining probability is only 4%. And, however, there is a problem that's, that uh, my methodology says that I should reject for all points which are of low probability. So, if I reject for everything above 28, I should also reject for everything below uh, the symmetric counterpart on the other side, because both of those have low probability. So that means that I have to, actually I have to have a two-sided test and it has to be symmetric. So 23 plus 5 is 28, means that 22 minus 5 would be 17. So my test should be to accept when um, the number is between 17 and 28. All of those are close to 22.5 and to reject if it's below 17 and to reject if it's above 28. Uh, so in that case my probability will be double of 3.6 percent or about 7.2 um, percent. So basically I have to keep going until basically at 29 I have 98.2 and that's it. If I, if I reject at 29 that's 6 plus 22 uh, then I also have to reject for the symmetric uh, uh, 
16. So between 16 and 29 is my acceptance. I accept for 16, 17, 18, up to 29. Then my total probability of rejection will be, uh, let's see, what is it? 98.22. So it's about... It's 1. Point, uh, 1.8, so double of that, 3.6, something like that. 3.6%. So that will be my 5% level test. So <coughs> in that test, what I will be doing, if I reject for 29, is that I will reject for all values of probability below 0 0.0184. That is the probability of... So I will be rejecting for any number, if I take my critical P star value, it will be 0 0.01 for example. If I say, okay, if the probability is less than 1%, I will reject. Probability is bigger than 1%, I will accept. This is the cutoff at which, but this 1% is not the alpha value. This is a very frequent confusion among students. 1% is my cutoff. I am rejecting for all x for which the probability will be less than 1%. That means x equals 30, 31, 32, all the way up to 45, and also 15, 14, all the way down to 0. Now I look at all of these numbers, and I calculate their sum probability, and that's going to be 3.6%, and that is my alpha, 3.6%. Okay, so that's the p. Uh, that's the alpha value. Now, uh, one thing that is important to note here is that in this method, if I make any any linearity, does not matter. The function can be linear or non-linear as long as it's monotonic. It keeps going in one direction, whether it's log or square then the me median will not change and so what is high and what is low will not change. But if the function is non-monotonic like the quadratic which goes up and down then things will get disturbed. But that means that this is much, uh, yani it, it can deal easily with non-linearity. It cannot deal with uh, uh, non-monotonicity. So this is a much more robust, uh, so two problems we have handled by this contingency table. One is the outlier problem it's finished because a uh, number can be as high as it likes. Uh, it is only going to count for one observation. And also, uh, the linear function is not important. It can be non-linear. As long as it's generally moving up, we will be able to follow it. A high will be high and low will be low. But uh, if there is a quadratic function, if there is a non-linear function, then there will be a problem. This method will not work for the quadratic function. So, then uh, what happens in non-monotonic relations is that we need more groups. We separate into low, medium and high. And if we do that, then if you look at the quadratic, if you think, imagine it. Ah, here. So, now if I divide it into three parts, you will see that the center will be empty and that uh, uh, center top will be empty and there will be uh, there will be numbers in uh, the first uh, three panels and in the last three but that's obviously already going to tell us that there's something wrong because in the zero association all of the nine cells will have equal number of points so uh, so if we make the subdivisions finer it will pick up any non-linear relationship so Assuming that we have enough data, we can track any relationship and uh, the linear function doesn't matter and the normality doesn't matter. So that's how this method is much better than the other one. But as I said, it's not, it doesn't work for trends and it doesn't work for clusters. If you have clusters, they will cause problems. Uh, and they, So it's a solution for some of the problems, but not for all of them. Okay, as I said, uh, this contingency table method does not work for trends. Okay. So, 
Now let me go back to the Excel. All right, so in the um, exercises that I have given you for this lecture, I have asked you to take any two series, hopefully from the World Bank development uh, indicators, which have thousands of series on different types of variables, and uh, look at the relationship between them, graph them, see if there is a nonlinearity, see if there is a, um, outliers, see if there are clusters, draw the regression line between them, calculate the correlation, assess if the regression line is a good description or a bad description. It can be good if the data is reasonably normal. As I, In fact, as we sh discussed in this, uh, after you take the log of the newspapers, correlation is roughly a, a good description and linearity is also a good description. So in that one, in that case, after taking the log of the newspapers, regression will work fine. So assess these and then use this contingency table method. And one thing I haven't taught you here is that use the three by three contingency table method. For that you will have to divide the data into one thirds. Basically here we have divided at the median there you would uh, divide at the third uh, percent, 33rd percentile and uh, then uh, make a 3 by 3 contingency table. And then now we cannot use the binomial. The, there is a methodology for doing that and I will explain that later on in the course. Uh, but for the moment if you just uh, plug it into any package all you have to do is count and then Fisher's exact test, if you run it on it, it will automatically tell you the, the answer, whether uh, the p-value it will give you. And this is uh, available in nearly every statistical package and also available on internet. I mean, you, know, you can just, uh, there are sites where it asks you to feed in your row by column contingency table. So you specify three by three table and then you put in the numbers in each table and you tell it the expected values. Now the expected values are very easy because it's 33% uh, any, basically it has to be 33% of the population in all of, sorry, one ninth of the population. One ninth of the population will go in every one of the nine squares in your three by three. So once it has the expected value and the, and the true value, it will tell you whether or not there is a match because according to the independence hypothesis, every cell should have exactly the same number and every cell should have about one ninth of the total number of countries. So uh, the technical details for the Fisher test are more complicated. Here I explained the technical details for the two by two, for the three by three I will uh, do that at some other point, but you can run the test without knowing the technical details. Okay, so that's all for today. Subhanallah, 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 Subh